Uh, so uh, thank you to the conference organizers. Um, this has been fantastic. I already had lots and lots of great conversations, so uh, thank you for putting this together uh, for the community. Um, I'm going to tell you today about uh, some work here where I tried to sort of, in the title, list a lot. It's kind of a summary of what I'm going to talk about. Um, we're going to talk about Hamiltonian engineering in the context of matter wave interferometers. Um, we're going to talk about a little bit about Q and D measurements, quantum non-demolition measurements, one axis twisting, two axis twisting in a Mossbauer uh, like f uh, collective recoil mechanism that we've seen in a matter wave interferometer. Um, this work is being done in my lab at Jilla in the Department of Physics at the University of Colorado. Okay, so let's jump in. Um, so all the work I'm going to do uh, is related to the idea that, you know, we'd like to go beyond single particle physics, you know, where you can kind of control every individual atom and see, make them dance up and down and do what you want. We actually want to connect them. We want to sort of not just do n copies of an experiment, but somehow have correlations or entanglement between these atoms so that they do something different or something that you can do better than just with independent atoms. And the way we're going to create uh, those kind of uh, correlations and entanglement is uh, via an optical cavity. So we're going to put these atoms inside of an optical cavity. A hyphen S uh, cavity light is going to bounce back and forth many, many times, and that's going to create these, uh, these desired effects. We're also like to emphasize that we really want to use all of quantum mechanics. We're interested in, you know, can we see unitary dynamics, use the quantum measurement process, and uh, also thinking about dissipation, okay? Um, the, the, the broad theme is we're, we're really trying to explore the fundamental science of quantum sensing, metrology, and many body physics, including quantum simulation. Today, I'll focus a little more on quantum metrology will be the focus of this talk. Um, we actually have three cavity QED experiments at the moment in my lab. There's another smaller project also starting up at the moment. Um, and uh, one in rubidium and two in strontium. Uh, these are big macroscopic cavities. These, these are not small scale uh, sort of, you know, 50 micron gap cavities. These are sort of of order a few centimeter separation between the mirrors. Um, uh, the one I'm going to focus on mostly today is uh, cavity-mediated interactions and matter wave interferometry being done in a rubidium system shown here. Okay, so you've heard a little bit about atomic spin squeezing. Uh, so here's just my standard quick intro slide. There's a standard quantum limit. If I have n spins, I build one big collective vector out of them. What's the angular uh, resolution and the orientation of this block vector? If they're unentangled, then essentially there's something called, what we'll call the standard quantum limit, which is one over square root of n radians. So you should really think of it as carrying units of radians. Really think of this as an angle, okay? Um, if we can create spin squeeze states, uh, you know, basically the idea is you can squeeze the noise out of one direction by creating uh, this entanglement between the atoms and put the noise in another direction you don't care about. So if you're building a quantum sensor of accelerations or of time or of a magnetic field, you can actually sort of read this out more precisely. You have a more precise hand for, for measuring the universe. Um, so here is my running summary of entanglement enhancements over the standard quantum limit. Uh, this is my best attempt. Uh, there's just always new stuff. So uh, uh, I haven't updated in a little while. Uh, but essentially, people have done this uh, using you know, uh, ion traps, for instance, people have used cold collisions between atoms, uh, you know, some of the work over here. Uh, you know, people have used interactions between Rydberg atoms. Um, also for reference on this plot is the enhancements over the sort of vacuum limited, um, you know, phase precision associated with squeezed light fields from Roman Schnabel's group are on this plot. On the horizontal is time, okay. In years, and then on the vertical, one means you're at the standard quantum limit, and this is in noise variance. So bigger number is better. It's on a log scale on the vertical here. Okay. So um, in terms of using uh, light fields and things involving cavities or light matter interactions, people have done quantum non-demolition measurements. Those are the round points, and also a kind of one-axis twisting uh, kind of dynamics to create entanglement. Uh, and both of the, the solid points here are referring to sort of light-based approaches. Uh, the work from my group are the red points here, um, and so we had some initial measurements by measuring, um, you know, doing Q&D measurements based on measurements about collective vacuum Rabi splitting. In later work, we were to go to a system where we could demonstrate Heisenberg scaling, not Heisenberg limit, but Heisenberg scaling of the phase sensitivity uh, in this work. And then in this work, this is about the best we've done, and it's basically our group and Mark Kasevich's group are kind of up here. There are also wonderful uh, results from Von Bulletich's group. 
Uh, Monica has also had some recent results uh, where they're beginning to see squeezing uh, in her county system. And of course, the original work uh, with uh, Inflon's group was with Monica and Ian at the time. Okay. Um, so about the best you can do is about an 18 dB improvement over the standard quantum limit. This is done in rubidium um, and two somewhat similar experiments, uh, one at Stanford and one in my lab. Um, I would like to go ahead and point out uh, that, you know, what, uh, you know, what kind of squeezing or entanglement enhancement has been applied to different types of sensors where you actually see a phase resolution where you operate it below the standard quantum limit. So at the output of the sensor, this has been done for clocks, you know, uh, Vladen and Eugene and Mark and Karsten over here and magnetometers, Eugene and Morgan Mitchell and Marcus Obertaler and others uh, here. Um, and I will point out, I'm not going to talk about it today, I think June mentioned it briefly, there's a new point here, this star uh, that uh, in a joint uh, experiment with Jun Yi, we were able to demonstrate a differential clock comparison where we had an enhancement uh, from squeeze states using Q and D measurements. Okay, so one of the things that's actually missing on this list is actually applying uh, squeeze states in the context of a matter wave interferometer and seeing that you can actually operate the full matter wave interferometer sequence with an enhancement in the phase resolution below the standard quantum limit, okay? And so that's, uh, that's missing, and so we, we think that this is important because if you look, uh, these light pulse matter wave interferometers are very, very important for exploring all kinds of wonderful science, as was talked about in the two previous talks by Tim and Saida, okay? So you can just read off over here if you want. You've also seen the big picture that the idea is you use light pulses to put atoms in superpositions of two different momentum states and separate them and recombine them and interfere them like you would with an optical interferometer, okay? Um, just in the context, I, uh, I'll just point out this paper. This is related to what Tim was talking about, where we actually did analyze what is the role of atoms in the context of these uh, proposed, you know, gravity wave detectors and dark matter detectors. And it turns out that, you know, they've been proposed to be done with optical lattice clocks as well as with matter wave interferometers. And, you know, really the, the role of the clock transition in these is that you need to be able to store the atomic coherence in a ground and optically excited state for the time scale of or it takes to basically propagate the light pulse between the two ensembles. Okay, that's really the role. But then after that, it's basically a quantum memory. So if you want, if you're sort of allowing the gravitational wave to accrue sort of some extra phase in your interferometer, you can actually store the, the phase in the ground states. You don't have to be in the optically excited state. So it's related to clocks, but it's not quite clocks. Okay, that's not really sort of what's driving uh, what's really necessary. It's really more of a quantum memory is how you're using this. And so we have this paper, which at least for me, it's one of those papers you write for yourself to say, I'd like to understand what's going on. And, and so I, I like this paper um, that we wrote. Um, okay, so in the context of going towards squeezed interferometers, there have been proposals uh, from uh, Tino's group, um, uh, from Murray Holland's group, uh, thinking about how to create uh, squeezed interferometers. Uh, there was some work using collisions between atoms and creating squeezing in the spin degree of freedom and then using Raman transitions to map that entanglement to momentum states and they could see that they had an entanglement involving the momentum states but they couldn't run an interferometer with it to see that they could improve the interferometer. Okay. So um, that's sort of what we set out to do and uh, this work was really led by Ching Yi Lo and um, Graham Grav. Uh, who, this is a, I'm not going to tell you the details of this experiment. It's a very hard experiment, and they pulled it off. So I really want to sort of emphasize them. I'm not going to tell you how hard this is. Okay. I'm going to give you the highlights. Okay. So uh, basically the idea is that we can create sort of squeezing where we're going to visualize our interferometer on a block sphere. There's some kind of uh, uncertainty in the relative phase. That's the azimuthal angle or the number of atoms in the two arms of the interferometer. That's the vertical here. Okay. We're gonna create the squeezing and then we're gonna inject it into an interferometer and we're gonna measure uh, sort of the, uh, the output of that interferometer and show it has a phase resolution below the standard quantum limit. Okay, so to do this, we run the entire matter wave interferometer inside of the hyphen S optical cavity that's vertically oriented so the atoms can follow along, along gravity in the vertical direction. Turns out we can inject all of our Raman and Bragg beams that allow us to manipulate the momentum states of the atoms to drive uh, momentum changing Raman transitions that also change, for instance, which hyperfine state you're in. I'll call that spin up and spin down. And so, for instance, you can see this in the velocity spectrum that we have sort of two peaks in a velocimetry spectrum separated by uh, 60 kilohertz in this case. Okay. 
We can also drive Bragg transitions where you do not flip the spin, internal spin state, but you change the momentum state. And for instance, we can prepare states at very large momentum separation, not 100, but 10. And we were, we, we were happy to call that large. Okay. But we can do all this along the axis of a high finesse cavity. Okay. So we had to, we had to work through all that. That was all new. Okay. So we can put uh, that kind of control together to drive a, what we call a Raman interferometer in a Mach Zender style configuration as shown here. We again visualize everything on a block sphere where now the momentum state also goes along with the internal hyperfine level. Okay, so we're labeling the arms of the matter wave interferometer with the internal hyperfine state over here. So if we do that, we can actually see an interferometer fringe, and then we can actually let the atoms fall under gravity and see that the phase that accrues goes like the evolution time inside the, inside the interferometer, goes like T squared, like you would expect. It's the same sort of scaling that you get if you drop a rock, right? Um, and so you see that we're sensitive to gravity. Okay, so I'm not going to go into details because I have some um, sort of more, uh, you know, hot off the press results I'd like to share today. Uh, but we were able to actually show that by taking advantage of the fact that we could label the two arms of the interferometer with the internal spin state, hyperfine state, we can actually implement a, a Q and D Hamiltonian of this form, where C dagger C are basically, you know, creation and annihilation operators associated with the cavity mode. And this is the total spin projection JZ of the atomic degree of freedom. And what this basically says is that depending on the value of JZ, we see a shift in the cavity resonance frequency. And by measuring that very, very precisely, we can actually back out and infer the value of JZ. So we can actually, in some sense, measure the quantum fluctuations and just subtract them out. And we actually localize via the measurement process into a state with less, with reduced uncertainty. So we could prepare about 3.4 dB of squeezing uh, with that approach. We could also uh, implement something called one axis twisting, where you create a Hamiltonian that looks like JZ squared. Uh, over here, we can see about two and a half dB of squeezing, and then we can inject these states into a full interferometer and see an enhancement in the phase resolution beyond the standard quantum limit. So that's what we wanted to achieve. And that's going to be my big summary of, of that result. So I'm going to take a breath. Okay. So I did it, we did it two different ways. We did it via Q&D measurements and one axis twisting. And um, one thing we just kind of wanted to work through for ourselves, and there's a paper on the archive is, you know, when is Q and D, you know, better? And when is one axis twisting better? Like what's, like is one of these fundamentally better? And so we just kind of worked through for ourselves and it's on the archive. You can find it. Diego, who was here um, earlier in the week, um, led this work. And basically the main, the main upshot is if you can build a readout, you know, a detector that has a quantum efficiency greater than three sixteenths, Q and D wins. If uh, you can't build a, a, a detector with a quantum efficiency uh, greater than 3 sixteenths, then actually this one X is twisting wins. It's a pretty generic result, even in different regimes where you have spin flips induced by the probes or not, right? So, so anyways, I, I'll, I'll reference this over here. Okay. okay, so with that, I'm gonna actually switch um, and uh, talk about something we're seeing more recently, which is cavity-mediated momentum exchange over here. It's described in this paper on the archive. This is in collaboration now with uh, Murray Holland's group and Maria Ray's group, um, and then uh, fantastic students and postdocs working on it over here. Okay, so here's the basic idea. Let's imagine that I have two atoms um, inside this cavity, and they, they're falling with an average momentum P naught, okay? But, you know, one is at minus h bar k, where k is two pi over lambda. It's gonna be the wavelength of the light that we're going to apply to cause these Bragg transitions. Um, and I apply a dressing laser into the cavity, so the other atom is at P naught plus H bar K, then I can have a process where essentially uh, the blue atom absorbs a photon from the pump and emits a photon into the cavity. And before that photon has a chance to escape out of the cavity mirror, actually the red photon can absorb it and go to the other momentum state. So what has happened? In this four photon process, uh, a photon is, is briefly emitted into the cavity and then reabsorbed in such a way that the atoms swap their momentum states. So if we think of it as, you know, atom J and atom I over here, and we think of this as a, like a pseudo spin system, a spin half over here, uh, then you can think of it as, okay, well, basically this is kind of some kind of exchange interaction over here, but I've got N atoms, and all the atoms interact with the same cavity mode, so, so therefore I have to sum over I and J from one to N atoms. And so this actually looks like a collective all-to-all -all exchange interaction that I can describe via these uh, collective raising and lowering operators. Okay. 
So in fact, this kind of exchange interaction was explored in our group and Monica's group uh, earlier and I give some references down here. And thinking about in the context of matter, wave, uh, matter waves, actually Murray Holland's group had done some original work thinking about this in the context of ring cavities. Whereas we were able to figure out that, oh, you can actually pull this off in a standing wave cavity without having to build a ring cavity. Okay. Um, I'd like to sort of, that was one picture of what's going on. I'd like to give you another physical picture of what's happening in this system. Um, after you apply initial Bragg pulse, in fact, every atom starts in P naught minus H bar K, and we apply a Bragg pulse to put each atom in a superposition of minus H bar K and plus H bar K. Okay. If I write down that wave function, this is what the wave function looks like in, in real space, where Z is the position along the cavity axis. So what does that mean? That means that actually the probability of finding the atom at some position Z goes like cosine squared K this. So it becomes a standing wave over here. And wherever the atoms are located, they actually look like a little piece of glass. Okay, they have some index of refraction associated with them that would actually um, sort of interact with the light field inside the cavity. Okay, we're in a far detuned dispersive limit. Okay. And so if you think about that, what it looks like then is that when we create this superposition, we actually create a density grading of where you find the atoms along the vertical direction. And this density grading is moving at velocity V naught, which is just the average momentum divided by N. So it's moving down. So now when we inject our pump light into the cavity from below, let's think about the light that's actually propagating upwards. That's this part over here at this dressing or dry frequency. And when we do that, you can actually get um, light that builds up inside the cavity. And we're going to put that light off resonance from the cavity. That's the Lorentzian here. So what can happen? Well, this is actually just like a Bragg mirror. Okay, so like in my lab, you know, the way you make a mirror of dielectric coatings is you have alternating layers of dielectric you know, index of refraction, and you space them by lambda over two, and you can get a coherent reflect, addition of reflection coefficients. And it's the same thing here, okay? But it's a movie mirror, so if you shine a laser at me and I, and I walk towards you, then the light that reflects off of it gets a Doppler shift, right? And that Doppler shift here is just a two photon Doppler shift, two K V naught over here. And so what that means is that it creates a, a new optical field inside the cavity that's actually blue detuned for this process. So now let's consider the light propagating from above. The light propagating from above, it can also scatter off this density grating in the backwards direction, and now it actually gets a red shift, get the opposite Doppler shift, okay? So now I've got two, these extra sidebands inside there, and here's the magic. It turns out that the frequency difference between this tone and this tone over there are exactly what you need in order to drive a Bragg transition. This is exactly the frequency difference in two tones that you would have to apply in order to couple the two different momentum states, minus h bar k and plus h bar k. Okay. I also want to point out that this is a collectively enhanced mechanism because every single atom is doing this. And so I take the electric field in the blue or the red sideband scattered by one atom, and because I have n of them, the electric field is n times bigger. And so that means that the electric field squared goes like n squared. And so sometimes this is kind of, you know, sort of in some regime that you could think of as like a a phase matching or equivalently like a superradian enhancement in this interaction with the cavity mode. Okay. So now I'd like to return to this, uh, this Bragg coupling over here. Because if I have a Bragg coupling, I'm just telling you it's like, it's having a Robbie coupling between, you know, two spin states. And how do we describe that? Normally we think on some block sphere. Here, notice now I've changed that the North Pole and South Pole no, no longer have hyper, hyperfine levels. This is a pure Bragg interferometer. Okay. These are only momentum states involved now. But now we can describe that sort of effective, you know, Bragg coupling over here as an effective magnetic field that's going to rotate your two-level system. So in reality, this is a two-photon coupling, but I'll describe it with some effective magnetic field B. And in the limit where actually I tune my pump such that the, one of the sidebands is on resonance with the cavity, then in that case, it's actually much more likely that the photon escapes from the cavity before it gets reabsorbed. And in that limit, what you see is that we can actually see that we get population transfer between one momentum state and the other that's collectively enhanced. Equivalently on the block sphere, it's saying that this, let me get my arms rotated right, uh, that here's my block vector, here's my fictitious magnetic field, I get a collective rotation as those photons leak out of the cavity downwards. And that's what we call superradiance, okay, in different limits. But it's a collective decay mechanism. So now I'd like to sort of say, well, what happens now? This is the configuration I just showed you. And here's the fictitious magnetic field associated with that two-photon Bragg coupling, which is a self-generated two-photon coupling. Now let's actually move 
the cavity or you know, the, the, the side end off resonance with the cavity. What happens? Well, remember, the atoms are trying to scatter some field, essentially drive this field into the cavity. And the cavity is basically a harmonic oscillator. And if I drive a harmonic oscillator on resonance versus way off resonance, there's a pi over two phase shift in the response of the harmonic oscillator. What does that mean in this case? It means that the relative phase relationship between the carrier and the sideband shifts by pi over two from here to here. That shows up as a rotation of the effective magnetic field on this block sphere picture by pi over two. And now it's actually below the block vector. So this self-generated field is actually below the block vector. How can we make sense of that? Well, let's just go back to our Hamiltonian where we say, well, look, the interaction is a J dot B, but I'm telling you that this B is proportional to the projection of the block vector onto the equatorial plane, so that's Jx, x hat plus Jy, y hat. You plug this in, I get Jx squared plus Jy squared. I can def define classically these like funny numbers over here, J plus minus, uh, like so, and I get something that looks like uh, Hamiltonian J plus J minus. If we throw some hats on it, then we can say we're doing quantum mechanics, um, and so these become collective raising and lowering operators, and so this is actually another way of thinking about how this exchange interaction uh, emerges from the system. If I rewrite this exchange interaction, I can rewrite J plus J minus ignoring some single particle terms as total J squared minus JZ squared. And I'd like to talk about the, the dynamical consequences of those two terms. Okay. So this term is actually, you know, what we talked about earlier, it gives rise to what's called one axis twisting. And what it says is that if I run my interferometer, and inside my interferometer I turn on these exchange interactions by actually turning on this dressing laser in the two different phase evolution periods of my interferometer, that I should see that it accrues a phase shift inside my interferometer that depends on the inversion, how many atoms are in minus h bar k versus plus h bar k. So it should depend on jz. And that's exactly what we see, that depending on sort of how we tilt the block vector in the very first pulse over here, we get a phase shift that depends linearly on that. We can also, just by changing the sign of the detuning of the emitted photon relative to the cavity resonance frequency, we can change the sign of chi. And by doing that, actually reverse the sign of this phase shift over here. So that's the Jz square term. But now I'd like to talk about this one, because this one actually is fun to play with. It's the J squared term. So in a matter wave interferometer, as was uh, talked about uh, previously, I create some pi over two pulse that splits into a superposition of momentum states and the two wave packets begin to separate from each other. And now if I were to apply another pi over two pulse, you know, say here, well, if they're still, if the wave packets are still overlapped, I will get some interference term between them. I'll see some contrast associated with that. But if I wait a very long time, they won't be spatially overlapped. If I apply another pi over two pulse here, they won't be spatially overlapped and I won't see any contrast. So we can actually do exactly that experiment, and that's the black points here. Okay, so we see a fall off in the, in the contrast as a function of the delay time uh, between when we apply the pi over two pulse and we apply the second pi over two pulse. That's normal matter wave interferometry, and that's why normally you have to put a pi pulse in the middle of your matter wave interferometer to undo this. What we see is when we turn on interactions, that in fact we see a fall off, but then actually we see it, the, the, the contrast stabilizes. There's something that's extending the coherence time in the system. And in fact, in this physical picture over here, you should think of it as, well, the only way that can happen is if it turns out the wave packets stop separating. They must remain somehow together, okay? And so there are different ways you can imagine wave packets, you know, getting, uh, you know, stuck together, which is they begin to separate in space, and it could be that they just freeze and they stop separating, or it could be that they, they begin to separate and then you turn on this interaction and they oscillate, okay? Well, if that's true, if I want to see if something is oscillating, I should, like a guitar string, I should pluck it. And I should listen and see if I hear ringing. And we can do that by essentially allowing the wave packets to separate for some amount of time, and then turning on this dressing laser after some finite delay time to allow them to separate, and then actually look at the contrast as a function of the interaction time. And in fact, what we see is oscillations in the contrast indicating that it appears as though they're connected by a spring. The wave packets <coughs> oscillate with respect to each other in time. Okay, and that's what these oscillations are telling you over here. Um, the, the, the resonance frequency is essentially chi n for this, is kind of what you predict in an ideal model. Okay. So, that's weird. I want to emphasize that that's weird, okay? So, um, why is that weird? Well, imagine this Gedanken experiment. 
Let's say I have a single photon source. I have n atoms over here, and I have no interactions. We all know what happens. I send that single photon in, it gets absorbed, and if I wait some amount of time, in time of flight, eventually I see one atom emerge from the cloud at velocity h bar k over m. This uh, mechanism actually says if I do that same experiment, but now with the momentum exchange interactions on, the whole cloud recoils at a velocity divided by 1 over n, where n is the number of atoms. So this really looks like the atoms are collectively recoiling as a single object, and Doppler dephasing is, is suppressed. So this is kind of like an interesting new kind of uh, Mossbauer-like or Lambdicki-like spectroscopy in the system where somehow you get a collective recoil that suppresses Doppler dephasing in the system. Okay. We can actually do numerical simulations that show exactly this collective recoil over here. I'm not going to go into those, but if, you, if you're interested, we can talk about it. Um, we can also see that numerical simulations where you see that ideally if you could get rid of the Jz squared term, you had just pure J squared, that in fact you could see narrowing in some kind of like Robbie spectrum uh, relative to an original uh, Doppler broadened sort of resonance over here without interactions. So it really has a lot of similar features to what you would think about it as, as Mossbauer spectroscopy. Um, so in the few minutes I have left, I'm going to tell you about two-axis twisting. So um, 30 years ago, uh, there was a paper um, where Kitagawa and Uita said, hey, look, you could create, you could do very interesting things if you could create a one-axis twisting Hamiltonian of this form. Okay. And lots of groups have thought about this and have done uh, beautiful work on this. Uh, but they also proposed in the same paper that you could actually have this uh, two-axis twisting Hamiltonian that actually creates squeezing exponential in time and actually allows you to go closer to the Heisenberg limit. This hasn't been done to the best of our knowledge. If it has, please tell us. But we don't think anyone has ever done that. So I'd like to tell you about how we're, how we're doing that. Uh, the basic idea is that I've already told you about a four photon process, which is the momentum exchange interaction over here, where essentially um, an atom, whoops, uh, there we go, an atom absorbs a photon from the pump, emits it into the cavity, the other atom absorbs it, comes back. You get a J plus, J minus term that goes like, you know, two pump photons, two cavity photons interactions over here. Over here, this is a new four photon process where by turning on an additional pump over here and choosing its frequency correctly, we can turn on a process that looks like both atoms start in the same momentum state, one atom moves to this state, emits a photon. But that same photon I can draw on this leg of the transition, and actually now the red photon can absorb it, stimulate emit into that pump, and actually they've moved together. So this is like a pair lowering uh, Hamiltonian. So you get terms that look like J plus squared and J minus squared. But this one goes like the Rabi frequency of one pump times the Rabi frequency of the other times two cavity interactions over here. So notice the difference in scaling for these two different terms. And that's going to be the key point. So if you set omega L equal to omega U, these are the same intensity over here, then in fact you get a JX squared Hamiltonian. So we've transformed from a spin exchange to a JX squared Hamiltonian. And this in fact was proposed by Sorensen and Molmer back in 2002. And so we can actually see that, we can do that experiment. I won't go into details, but essentially we map the flow lines on the block sphere, and we can actually see this 2 axis twisting Hamiltonian. But now I'd like to point out that because of this differential scaling over here, it says we can also do uh, other kinds of Hamiltonians. In particular, it turns out that if you sort of carefully balance and you make the ratio of the Rabi frequency squared equal to 0.06, okay, then it turns out you can actually get Jx squared minus Jz squared. Okay, and that's a two-axis twisting Hamiltonian. And so in fact, this, uh, this actually, we real, you start inventing stuff and you go, oh yeah, other smart people have thought about this in the past too. So it turns out, uh, you know, uh, you know, Beauregard and, and Monica and Sorensen over here had, had thought about this in the past, but using a four applied tones. But essentially just by reducing the power in one of these two tones, we can get two axis twisting out of the system. So it's a much simpler way of doing it uh, on the experimental side. Okay. So we can actually map that out here, if, uh, measured flow lines in the lab. You can see a bifurcation point sitting here. So we can zoom in on that bifurcation point. Here's a simulated flow lines. You should have a, a you know, bifurcation point. We can actually see, do a vector map of how the block vector moves under the application of these interactions. And we, we see what we expect there. Um, now, I want to point out that, in fact, there's something called twist and turn, where essentially you start with one axis twisting plus a transverse field uh, over here. And then you can actually convert that into something that locally looks like two axis twisting. You get a bifurcation point. Okay over here, but if you look at it, if you look at sort of the, 
you know, this sphere, you'd see there are three stable points and one bifurcation point. And so, you know, groups, uh, various groups have done this kind of Hamiltonian. But what we actually observe in our system and our data is four stable points where you expect them and two bifurcation points. So it really has the right sort of, I'll call it topology associated with two axis twisting. Okay. We have lots of ideas in terms of future directions, in terms of now we need to um, uh, sort of do some improvements on laser phase noise and frequency noise and see if we can actually push below the standard quantum limit uh, using these new tools. Uh, there are ideas associated with doing momentum pair creation. Uh, we thought about this in the context of strontium optical lattice clocks. Monica also does this in spin degrees of freedom, uh, where you essentially you, you create sort of pairs in adjacent momentum states. We have lots of uh, ideas. Uh, we also are interested in dissipative creation of entanglement, as was talked about some yesterday. Uh, we think we have a system that's amenable to that. Uh, we also think that it could be a lot of fun to actually do a Q&D measurement on the spatial phase of the standing matter wave grating that you're building. We think there's a path to actually doing that by doing homodyne detection of the field that leaks out of the cavity over here. So we have lots and lots of ideas. Uh, with that, I'm gonna stop. We also do stuff in strontium. We can do spin exchange experiments in strontium. We actually can see this same gap protection against single particle dephasing, where if we turn up our atom number, we increase the kind of energy scale that gap protects against this single particle dephasing. We can see very, very long increases in uh, coherence time now on an optical transition over here. Um, and uh, lastly, we're, we also have a cavity QD experiment where we're building up to build uh, very, very stable uh, lasers using the one millihertz uh, optical transition in strontium as the gain medium for a laser. So very insensitive vibrations. And in principle, the shallow Townes line width can be quite low. So we think that this is really an, a qualitatively different, interesting uh, approach. We're building up that experiment. It's a ring cavity uh, where we're going to load atoms in one region, transport them along the cavity axis, and get them to laze in another region over here. So we're demonstrating various aspects of that. But in addition to super there are going to be interesting novel spectroscopy. So for instance, on the millihertz transition, we've been able to just use the cavity to directly observe absorption dips on a millihertz line with transition. So this is sort of one. These are different high, um, uh, nuclear spin transitions on the quark transition. They're split out by a small magnetic field. And we can see, oh, laser light gets absorbed here and it gets absorbed here. We can measure phase shifts. So there's gonna be lots of interesting ways of doing spectroscopy even beyond super radiance. Okay, so with that, let me thank uh, the students and postdocs who did that. Um, really, really, uh, I've covered up all the details. These are hard experiments. They, get, they deserve a lot of credit. Uh, but in addition, I'd like to you know, really thank Anne Maria Ray and her group, Murray Holland and his group, uh, and Jun Yi for various collaborations. Thank you. Thank you for the nice talk, sharing the exciting results. Questions? Let's start here. Really nice talk. Um, um, just a very naive question. I mean, uh, Am I correct to understand that this is basically optomechanics or crystal yeah. optics, but just in the atomic physics language? Um, we, we, we actually like that analogy, and we're trying to understand in what way to explore it, because I think that, for instance, if you look at um, here, um, uh, you know, for instance, this configuration, that's, not, that's the kind of thing you would do in, in optomechanics, right? You could imagine, for instance, thinking about a cavity optomechanics transducing excitations between matter wave degrees of freedom and photons, for instance, right? That maybe there are some ways to do that. So I think there are really some nice overlaps. However, for the work I'm talking about, if you really wanted to draw a better analogy, imagine you had uh, N harmonic oscillators, so like M membranes or whatever you want. You had N of them, they were all identical and they all had a, a nonlinearity in their vibrational frequency at the single photon level. And then they all interacted with the same cavity. Then I think it's, then I think it's analogous. But people have also looked at phonons, right? Uh, phononic crystals, uh, in, interaction of phonon modes with optics. So would that be the correct analogy in that case? Yeah, except did you, that, that nonlinearity I talked about is the important part of what I just said. They don't have single phonon nonlinearities. In the mechanical, in the electromagnetic spectrum, because of the Josephson junction, they do, right? There they can define a qubit, right? Because of that nonlinearity. 
And that's what I'm trying to make a distinction, that these are not in, you know, it's not in harmonic oscillators. It's in spin halves. But otherwise, there's going to be a very, very fruitful cross, you know, sort of pollination between ideas that are used for, for instance, back action evading experiments, uh, actually could be implemented in this system as well. So what would be the difference uh, in terms of interaction strength and all that relative to like Oscar Painter's experiments? Yeah, these are full like, and... like in principle, like we're not there, but we think we can get into a deeply entangled state. And I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> Um, I was wondering, the results you showed regarding this population transfer, could you interpret this effect as a four-wave mixing process between the two momentum states and the two cavity modes? Because in that case, you would also see a population transfer to a previously unpopulated state, which could, I mean, explain why this package isn't separating it as much as you would expect. Um, so. We, you're absolutely right that I showed a two-level system, and we've considered the effect of additional momentum states out of the two-level basis. And the main effect associated with that is you get a slight renormalization of chi, the interaction strength, but it doesn't actually in any way modify the exchange interaction or the wave packet separation effects. Okay. That, that, that's what we see. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, so when you had when you showed this effective n body coupling, um, this was uh, this exchange interaction. Yeah, with the two atoms in, or the n atoms in a cavity. Uh, yeah. Oh shoot. Um, you know, it's uh, somewhere at the beginning, right? Yeah, um, yeah. Um, the, the the parameter that comes associated with that interaction at least theoretically, can be estimated with exponential precision because of this n-body coupling. So my question is, is that parameter something of interest that people might wish to measure? Yeah, like, so, so, so the question is like, well, let's say your, your goal in life was I wanted to know the value of chi. I don't want to measure, measure dark matter. I want to measure chi. Yeah, my question is, what is the physics inside chi? Is that yeah. something people would really like to know very precisely? Uh, n no, I think I, I think I would say it's more of something we can calculate. And if I go forward, uh, that's the problem with all these animations. Um, I want to get to the uh, 2x is twisting this one. Um, so basically, if you think of these as four photon processes, um, this chi, uh, you know, okay, up to an h bar needs to have units of frequency. So let's you do unit analysis. I've got, you know, frequency squared here. So I better have three detunings in the, in the bottom. Two of those detunings are set by the detuning of the dressing laser from an intermediate optical excited state. And the other detuning that appears in the denominator is the detuning of the emitted photon from resonance with the cavity. That becomes the other relevant detuning over here. And so it's, it's a pretty well-defined uh, object, but basically you take these expressions up to numerical factors and you just need to divide. We can actually sweep out, and I'm not gonna show that data, I have it, uh, you can ask me afterwards, where we actually look at the strength of chi as a function of the detuning of that emitted photon from resonance with the cavity, where we sweep that detuning, that emitted photon all the way through resonance, and it ma matches exactly what we expect. It gives you a, for experimentalists, it gives you something that looks a lot like a pound over hall error signal. Uh, uh, for the non-experimentalists in the room, uh, basically it gives you some uh, some sort of lumpy curve that looks very dispersive-like in nature. It's what we expect. Um, an another interpretation question. So for yes. this um, momentum, most power like momentum transfer yeah. that you showed, um, it reminds me a little bit of, um, well, uh, maybe two-body scenario like where you have in the BC, BCS crossover, you form molecules, right? And then you impart momentum and yeah. you wonder, is this behaving like single particles or, or well, in that case, dimers? So there, there is a characteristic energy scale, the binding energy. Yeah. Is there an equivalent scale? Yeah, yeah. So, so basically, if you have some kind of single particle dephasing, if I take sigma, let's pretend it's Gaussian, whatever it is, here, if you want to think in terms of wave packet picture, you should think of it as like sigma is like the you know, standard deviation associated with the Doppler broadening of the transition. 
So whenever sigma divided by chi n becomes of order one or less, you start to get this gap protection. So basically, the chi n, the, the characteristic interaction scale, which is collective in nature, so more atoms is better, it's better and better as you, as you increase the atom number. So it's not a single particle effect. It really is an n-body, well, not, not n-body in the sense of like sigma one, sigma two, sigma three, not like that, but like it's really all in atoms contributing. Just to complement, in fact, Exactly the same model gives you the B, B, C, B, C, S crossover. So this J is where it, it, it's the pairing gap. So, so it, it's. Yeah, and, and, and uh, basically we, we have a paper on the archive where we think about sort of modeling BCS superconductors and predicted oscillations that you see. Um, and there may be some connection to exploring B, C, B, C, S crossover simulations or emulations in these experiments. So this is a nice result on realizing the counter-twisting Hamiltonian, and I just wanted to ask, um, do you expect actually a benefit from it for squeezing in your system or in other regimes or? Totally unclear. I, I'm going I'm to approach this in two different ways. One is, um, I read the Kitagawa and Uida paper when I was uh, in, in my PhD, and I have always just sat and thought, could we really do it? Is there some way to pull off and see honest to God two axis twisting um, and so for me, it's a little bit of the, the white whale, you know, like, okay, I, f I finally got the white whale, you know? Um, and, uh, and so from, from that perspective, I find it very satisfying. I think in your analysis with, you know, um, Anders, um, that you actually show that actually there is not an intrinsic benefit with respect to the usual NC limits. That in other words, like you're always limited by one over root NC, which seems to, like if we could just prove that this is a theorem, that would be awesome. So we could just like, Accept it. I don't think that analysis dealt with strong overlap properties. It's possible. It's possible maybe if our C got our single particle C got big enough, then maybe maybe there could be some win. I my my my, sus, my suspicion at this point is if if there's a win in our system, it's because somehow we're not hitting the fundamental NC limit, and so maybe there's other single particle decoherence if we could go fast compared to then we can win, but I, I really think it's an open question. Is there a fundamental, it's true that if you could really work at C of order N, right, uh, so like 100 atoms and C of order 100, right, like sort of, um, that, that in that limit, maybe you could go to a point where you say, I could saturate the twist and turn, but by doing true, uh, you know, two axis twisting, I could go another like three to 10 dB or something like that, and squeeze it and get much closer to the Heisenberg limit. But it's not, it's not going to be a 20 dB difference, I don't believe. Any further question? Yeah. Uh, so just a quick comment. You mentioned uh, two axis twisting experiment. Um, so just in case you did not know, uh, there was actually an experiment uh, by Eugene Pauzik's group on two axis twisting. OK, um, I need to look. That's awesome, because that's what we've been looking for. Uh, right, but it, it dealt with uh, internal spin. Okay. So I will show you the paper. Um, what, what I know is uh, that I have to be a little bit careful because sometimes you can convince yourself something's two axis twisting, and then you look carefully at it and you realize it's J Z squared plus um, a transverse field, and a Holstein Primakov approximation has been made, and then they say it's two axis twisting. And it's not like wrong, like 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 I'm not I'm not I'm not criticizing anyone, but I would just say I would I, I'd like to look carefully at it because you really have to examine sometimes closely to see what's the global Hamiltonian, not a local approximation. And to, just to point this out, this was in the single atom, so this is the single atom spin, which... Oh, it's an eternal degree of freedom? Okay. Uh, just to emphasize, all the squeezing here is between atoms. Yeah, which, very in, different, yeah. which in my view is actually kind of, you know, nature is not giving you a natural energy scale to protect you against dephasing and to help you maintain entanglement. Because we know entanglement comes for free in nature just because of natural energy scales. I think one of the important parts about quantum metrology is when nature doesn't give you a natural energy scale, can you still pull it off, right? And that, that, that's what entanglement between atoms is about. Okay, one more question. Um, I just have a general question about uh, the Heisenberg limits because I don't understand atomics very well, but yeah. in optics, it's been known for decades that the uh, Heisenberg limit is, is not really achievable in practice because of loss. Yeah. Anytime you have any significant or, or any loss, you can only improve upon the short noise limit by a fixed factor. So I'm just wondering why people are still obsessed or 
uh, people are still interested in the Heisenberg limit in atomics, what would be the difference in those systems that, that where, where the Heisenberg limit is actually practical? Okay. So in almost all of the experiments I do, we can do, for instance, experiments where we see Heisenberg scaling, which means we run parallel to the Heisenberg limit as we increase the odd number, uh, but we're, you know, we might be like 40 dB away from it, right? So we can see Heisenberg scaling. The scaling is very important in these systems. I think that it's a little bit of, as a function of system size, can I really demonstrate I can exert full you know, control over my quantum system, right? And so for instance, if you say I have an ion trap and it's easy for me to precisely and accurately trap ions up to 50, well, you'd like to use every, squeeze out every single bit of precision you can from that finite amount of resources. So from that perspective, I think it's interesting. But I will make this argument. Sometimes people say, well, but you're not at the Heisenberg limit. And I would say, well, maybe it actually doesn't matter. Um, for instance, imagine I had a 20 dB of squeezing, which is not so far off from where we are. And um, I did it in a million atoms. If I wanted to build a GHZ state, I could take 100 atoms, build a GHZ state, and each of that GHZ state would be at its Heisenberg limit. But I would actually have to build 10 to, four, 10 to the four of them in parallel, all in 50 microseconds, all perfect, in order to get the same phase re resolution we get for making a single 50 microsecond measurement on our cloud. So in some sense, I do think that you have to be a little bit careful about you know, comparing apples to apples. And in some sense, the squeeze states, just like it's not a good idea to inject into LIGO, uh, entangled pairs of photons. You know, what, what naturally works on LIGO is actually injecting some squeezed vacuum. I think actually these squeeze states are actually very well matched to measurement um, in terms of their capabilities. Uh, my question is that in Texas, no, no, so the, you're absolutely right. Uh, in these atomic systems, it turns out that we can control uh, loss better than photons. Photons are really slippery. It's really easy to lose photons. Um, they're, they're cheap. I can buy them pretty cheaply. Uh, but on the other hand, it's very easy to lose them. And, and I think that is one difference, that we can go further beyond the standard quantum limit. That's why I think we can outpace, for instance, Roman Schnabel's group, uh, Furusawa's group in the optical domain. All right, uh, thank you again, James.